let's get back to the, the to, let's 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 start with the video. I wanna. I'm really curious. I want to see this. But yeah, I don't know much about the serpent, so I'm I'm interested to see and learn. Let me know if the audio is all right. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. Okay. That was quick. <laughs> Kill them all, the Lord will recognize his own. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> that is fucked up. Kill them all, the Lord will recognize his own? Holy moly! Serpent of the Earth Tree. Wow. Hello, everyone. We here at the headquarters of Tarnished Archaeology have been enjoying the Colosseum DLC over the past couple of months. It's quite a bit of chaotic fun and a welcome addition to tide us over until Story DLC arrives and we can sink our teeth into a whole new set of ruined architecture and statues. It may surprise you, though, that in the Colosseums of Elden Ring, like those of real-world Rome, a very specific story was played out, meant to entertain and distract the ancient spectators. Hmm. It is the story of the Crucible Knights and the defeat of their ancient enemy, the Serpent God. As has been pointed out by others, including the up-and-coming rising star YouTuber known as Vatividia, you all should check him out by the way, we see great things in his future, the ritual shield and sword talismans, which speak of ritual combat in the Colosseum, are clearly modeled off of the Crucible Knights sword and shield, yeah. indicating that the Crucible Knights themselves once participated in ritual combat back in the heyday of the Colosseum. That's cool. As for their enemies, well, they wear the icons of snakes, which are seen as traitors to the Erd Tree. Nice and according ball. to their armor set, quote, the audience delighted in seeing their bronze effigies beaten and battered, end quote. Yeah, they look like they bend over so pretty evidently, easily. evidently, the Crucible Knights would ritualistically combat and probably kill the avatars of the snakes in the Colosseum, like Romans recreating and reliving ancient battles in their Colosseum. What this clearly recalls is an ancient hostility between the serpent and the Erd Tree. Stories told of the treachery of the snake were evidently widely known. Otherwise, why would the crowd at the Colosseum cheer with such delight in seeing these serpentine effigies beaten and battered? But almost nothing in-game actually explains this hostility, yeah. at least not directly. As always, hidden beneath the surface well, lies souls a deep content and mysterious for you. story. The story of the Erd Tree, its ancient enemy, the Serpent God, and the lands between's long forgotten pagan past. The most obvious place to start unraveling this story would be the Volcano Manor. Yep. It is, after all, ruled over these days by a giant snake who's quite fond of fire and lava. Rikard's symbol is that of a great serpent devouring the world, and we know his ambitions were regarded as blasphemous. So much so, in fact, that the siege of Mount Gelmir is the only known example of an offensive expedition all the way up. by the forces of Landell, who otherwise remained in a predominantly defensive stance during the Shattering War. Think of the first or second defenses he of Landell. He is Lindell. a little quiet. So intolerable were Rikard's actions and plans that Landell, for the first time since the Lyurnian Wars concluded, actually ventured beyond their impregnable walls and besieged an enemy. Ugh. The assault on Mount Gelmir resulted in a wretched, unending war with no glory, which Gideon Ofnir calls, quote, the stage of the most appalling battle in the entirety of the Shattering. End quote. So again, why? Of all the depravity of the Shattering, Melania's rot, Moog's abduction of Mikola, 
Godric's feeble grasps at ancient power through grafting, Ugh. why was Rykard's blasphemy so intolerable that this appalling battle of unending death and suffering was a worthwhile price to pay? Like the story of the Colosseums, this reflects the ancient enmity between the snake and the Erd tree that is merely resurfacing in modern times. When we do enter the Volcano Manor proper, this enmity is plain to see. Lady Tanith rather matter-of-factly announces that, quote, this is a war against the Erd tree, end quote, and solicits you to, quote, rise with us against the Erd tree, oh, end yeah. quote. No doubt, this is what is meant by blasphemy, a word which means essentially to speak ill of a god, as opposed to the more common accusation of heresy, which derives from the Greek word for choice. Heresy oh. is what the orthodoxy tends to call the non-orthodox faiths, whereas blasphemy is basically talking smack about God. And you'll okay. agree, Tanith and Reichard definitely fit that description. That is a Not cool only do they speak openly about rebellion. That is a sick image. Whoever drew that deserves a raise. I love it. That is, that's good. That's good. That would make a good wallpaper for my computer. Everything's a Berserk reference. Card definitely fit that description. Not only do they speak openly about oh. rebelling against the Erd Tree and the Greater Will, but in the manor itself, there are several paintings of a burning Erd Tree. <laughs> initially somewhat muddled by the saturated red lighting, but which is reproduced in concept art. So there can be no doubt as to what it is actually depicting. Get fucked, This is tree. about as blasphemous as it gets. Yeah. In the prison sense. town, we see the consequences of this war against the Erd Tree playing out in their full horror. Once again, with the common folk suffering the worst of all. The crucified and burned corpses all wear the symbols around their necks of devotion to the Erd Tree. And, found within a dungeon on a tortured and now long dead corpse, we find an Erd Tree seal, said to be, quote, once the focus of religion in the lands between, end quote. Hmm. Clearly, the inhabitants of the manor have turned against those loyal to the Erd Tree and have tortured and killed them. Even the hanging cages found throughout the manor, an idea Miyazaki has clearly liked since the days of Latria, take clear inspiration from the Anabaptist Rebellion in Munster, during which a radical Protestant sect, <coughs> I know, it sounds funny to us too, yes, a radical Protestant sect essentially took the city hostage, ending with key leaders of the rebellion being hanged from cages outside the city's main cathedral. Oh. Oh, that's bad. There are actually more inspirations from this time period in European history, which we will discuss in a moment, but for now, the point is, this whole scene conveys religious strife and persecution. So without a doubt, this is a religious cleansing happening on Mount Gilmir. Those loyal to the Erd Tree have been massacred by those loyal to Reichardt, the Serpent God, and their blasphemous religion. But if there's all this purging of Erd Tree loyalists and iconography going on, what about all those tree banners still hanging in a few places within the manor? Are they on fire? They're and pretty easy to miss, but they are definitely there. How come those weren't pulled down and destroyed too? It well, sure seems a damaged. bit odd for a town consumed by religious rebellion to just allow the banners of the faith to still- yeah, They're all damaged though. Maybe it's just a reminder that they're going to rip it apart. You know, kind of like how uh, people would have picked... <laughs> you know, this kind of reminds me of like 90s and 2000s movies. Whenever somebody had someone that they hated and they'd have like pictures of them on the wall, they'd throw darts at them. That's kind of... Maybe that's what they're doing. They're just throwing darts at it. They're like, yeah, I see you, you motherfucker. Yeah, they just... Shredding it apart a little bit more every single day with their mental instability. <laughs> They'll fly. Well, what if we told you those aren't Erd Tree banners at all? <gasps> if you take a look at where they're actually found in game, there are just a few places. 
One, beyond the Capitol Rampart in Landell, past the Saint statues in an older part of the city. Two, in the fortified manor, paired with banished knight banners and again among some saint statues. And three, finally, in Stormvale, amidst, you guessed it, saint statues and banished knight banners. And nowhere do you find these crimson and gold banners simply mixed in with Erdtree banners. Oh. They represent distinct iconographic strata. Of course, we understand the initial intuition that these are just different representations of the same tree, like say, banners of different sizes or shapes. But if you look closely... Yo, I want tapestries in my house one day. Bridges. <laughs> no. Shells, though, maybe. Maybe shell. That just doesn't hold up. Because they are never found together and are found in distinct architectural strata. They have different colors and even subtly different shapes. There are plenty of Erdtree banners with different shapes, but these crimson and gold banners are something else entirely. They are representations of sacred trees from different eras. Hmm. This is the banner- Do you think that maybe that's the original tree? If it's true that the Erdtree replaced the old tree? Maybe they worship the old order? before the Golden Order came by and was like, ha ha, hey, how was up? Or equivalent of the Great Tree Relief. And in fact, it's no coincidence that those two are often found together. Even if you prefer to think that this is just another banner of the Erd Tree, it is definitely a tree banner from during the time of the Great Tree Reliefs and Saint Statues, during the time when Stormvale and the Fortified Manor were built. In other words, the time before the Erd Tree. We'll return to the full implications of this later on in the video, but for now, just keep in mind that the Volcano Manor was part of the Saint and Tree Stratum, at least for a time. Keep this in mind as we piece together this story. Okay. Gelmir's pagan past. Returning to Reichard and his blasphemous intentions, Reichard did hey, not Bella. invent this blasphemy, he merely succumbed to it. Multiple items attest to the ancient serpent cult of Mount Gelmir. For example, the Serpent God's Curve Sword, like which that. reads, quote, Curve Sword fashioned in the image of an ancient serpent deity and it's tool cool of a forgotten religion practiced on Mount Gelmir, end quote. And the sorceries of Mount Gelmir, for example, Magma Shot, are all called ancient hexes that were specifically rediscovered by Reichardt. So there was an ancient serpent cult on Mount Gelmir long before Reichardt. And like so is that a molt then? Like, like is that a, not a molt, I guess, a, a snake shed? Or is that a statue? Likely even before the age of the Erd Tree. The practice of this religion seemed to involve ritualistic human sacrifice using the serpent god's curved sword and presumably the feeding of this ritual offering to the serpent god himself. This cult seems to be modeled off of ancient pagan cults that existed prior to, and to an extent during, the Christianization of the Roman Empire. One such cult, the Glycon cult, worshipped a man-serpent deity and spread in popularity among the Romans in the first centuries AD. Oh, that's cool. Its adherents, by some I'm reports, freaky. including the emperor Marcus Aurelius himself, they gave it ears. Like, they gave it protruding ears. Oh, there's something wrong about giving a snake human ears. Like, snakes do have ears. They they do. They, they're, they have the cavities that go in, and then they have a, a thin, a thin, f like, flat. Like, we have that membrane inside, too. Theirs is just on the outside. Oh, to prevent stuff from getting in, but my lord, giving a snake human ears, that is just wrong. That, oh, something about that just ain't ain't right. Yeah, well, there, I don't know, would you consider that a furry or would you consider that a scaly? Is there a difference? Is that a real, is scaly a thing you would call them? Yeah. <laughs> Subset of furries, got it. 
So it's like the wyvern debate all over again. All right, we're just gonna stick with that. Either way, this is, this, this is heresy. Erected statues and minted coins with Glycon's image. The actual practice of the cult, the term cult, by the way, doesn't have the same connotations in antiquity that it does today, seem to center on the snake god's powers over fertility. Women oh. who were unable to Everything bear children would fertile. perform the rituals right. of the cult in the hopes that they could become pregnant. It's not hard to see why this cult's leader was criticized as being a charlatan. There you are, good after bridges. all, much more straightforward ways of getting women pregnant. And the implied accusation was that that is exactly what he was doing with the women behind the closed doors of the temple. Putting snakes in but them? But for us, the point is that this cult of fertility matches quite well with the manners local religion yeah, that does look like of a shed. offering up sacrifices via the serpent god's yeah, the whole thing sword is a shed. in order to produce new births, what some would later call a repellent birthing ritual, according to the serpent's amnion. Anyone who has seen our Cycle of Life trilogy knows that the Erdtree Orthodoxy, whose power comes from strict control over the means of life and death in this world, specifically Erdtree burial and Erdtree birthing, does not tolerate alternative means of birth. As you can see, this works quite well oh, as an artistic- So is that why they're all pissy with- like, would they be pissy with Renala then? Cause like she rebirths you? Man, I just wanted different stats. It's not fair. The conspiration. But beyond that, as a guiding structure, both the Glycon cult and the serpent religion of Mount Gelmir are local pagan cults. Ones that practice heretical means yeah, of maybe control she's pissed off over about life it. and death. You can hate and your own mom. Remnants of the pre Christian, that is to say, pre Erdtree era. So doesn't that mean that Merica is also technically their father? No, it's being reborn, S1. I go to Ranala so that I can be reborn. We, you know, I need to learn more about this whole Merica, uh, Radagon thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how it works, Sean. I'd be a little bit miffed if- I mean, I understand why uh, Ranala was so distraught. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Like, did they fuse or- I don't know. We have to- we have to learn about that. I don't even know if there's any solid information on it. Hmm. This is exactly what the early Christians hated. It's no coincidence that the serpent bow refers to, quote, pagan magic, end quote. There was nothing more intolerable to the early Christians than reminders of Rome's pagan past, just as there is nothing more intolerable to the Erdtree faithful than reminders of the early pagan, that is to say, polytheistic, heritage of the lands between, before Erdtree monotheism subsumed all such local religions. The air there would be so hot it would burn your lungs. I'm just, just saying. You don't want to get that close to, to magma. Do not try this at home. <laughs> As Christianity progressed, many local deities and heroes were turned into saints, or otherwise their stories were adapted to fit the new Christianized culture. As an example of this process, in Baltic mythology there is a famous folktale of the Queen of the Serpents, an ordinary woman who is tricked into marrying a snake prince, bears snake children, kills her husband, and ultimately turns herself and her children into trees. The name of this Serpent Queen, by the way, is Igle. And it is here at the intersection of the rising tide of Christianity and the residual pagan traditions of Northern Europe that we find many of the inspirations for the manor story. Previously, we've invoked the Knights Templar as a model for the warrior monks depicted in the saint statues, but the historical inspiration drawing from the Crusades goes far beyond just that. 
You see, the initial crusades, starting with Pope Urban II's famous Clermont invocation, and arguably peaking with the very first crusade, which occupied Jerusalem, were attempts by the Western Roman Church to take back the Holy Land, that is to say, Jerusalem and the Levant. Certainly a video game archaeology series is not the proper forum to arbitrate the moral validity of the Crusader cause, yeah. even in its early days. But suffice it to say, they were, and remain, quite controversial. But in the specific aim of taking back the Holy Land, although Jerusalem itself was not mentioned at Clermont, at least initially they were a success, establishing a handful of Crusader states which lasted varying amounts of time. And somewhat shockingly, they appear to have been genuine grassroots movements, propelled by the zealous belief in the righteousness of their cause by the faithful. But, once having seen the potential power wielded by these crusading armies, it wasn't long before some would co-opt this movement for more cynical motives. Perhaps the ultimate example of this is the sack of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade, one of the most ignominious episodes in- Y'all, this guy's eyes are fucking wild. He's seen some shit. Holy moly, look at that guy. I mean, he's seeing some shit right now. This is a battle, but like... That guy's not having a good time. In all of history, <laughs> whereby the Queen of Cities, which had withstood countless sieges by invading armies over many centuries, was sacked and pillaged by a crusading army. The immense suffering of the people of Constantinople is well recorded, the first time since Constantine himself ordered the city built that its walls were breached. That it would ultimately be sacked by a Christian army, no less, was an irony not lost on many. In any event, right around the time of this Fourth Crusade, other attempts at leveraging the power of crusading armies were taking place. This time, instead of trying to retake the Holy Land, quote unquote, these were attempts to Christianize the pagan peoples of Northern Europe. Wars of territorial aggression couched in religious justification. Whatever one thinks of the First Crusades, clearly these forced conversion attempts of the later Crusades were a far cry from those early days of grassroots religious fervor. And among the folk tales, pagan elements, and stories of these Northern Crusades, we find the inspiration for the story of the Volcano Manor. The Northern pagan peoples, who worshipped many local deities, including snake deities, and practiced sacrificial rituals considered to be heretical and blasphemous, were the last holdouts of paganism in Europe. Humans are fucked. Whenever I learn about history stuff, about humans, and what we've done to each other, what we're still doing to each other. You'd think that we would know better by now. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah, I got my coffee bridges, I'm doing my best. Yeah, no, that's, that's some insane stuff, Sean. Yeah, if I turn it around, you know, maybe maybe go extinct. Who knows? As a general inspiration, the crusading forces fighting to Christianize the last remaining pagan holdouts of Europe, it fits quite nicely with our story of the Volcano Manor thus far. But beyond that, in the specifics, we can find some very interesting stories. For one, the game seems to tell us that the banished knights were the original crusading force, that incorporated the manor into cool. the Saint and Tree Empire, hence why we see their banner hanging within the manor, okay. and even their weapons in some of the siege towers, though this may be from the later siege. The banished knights, said to have been forced to abandon their homes, and fierce warriors who were each and all accomplished- Y'all, the, the lighting on that armor though, just like watch it being affected by the different lighting, it's so beautiful. Their siege. The banished knights, said to have been forced to abandon their homes, and 
fierce warriors who That's were amazing. each and all accomplished would go on to be hired as mercenaries, or as in the divergent cases of Oleg and Engval, fight on opposing sides of the Shattering. But the reason they all have standardized armor and weaponry is that they used to be part of a single order, with a unified purpose. This story parallels quite nicely with the various orders of Crusading Knights in medieval history. You may have heard of some of them, the Knights Templar, the Teutonic Knights, yeah. the Hospitallers. Yeah. There was even one called the Livonian Order, dedicated Didn't... specifically to Christianizing them. the Baltic region. And after the fall of the Crusader states in the Levant, those states that were established in the First Crusade, the Crusaders were armies without a nation. After these territorial losses, you might call them, they ended up scattering across Europe in the Mediterranean. Some, like the Teutonic Knights, actually founded a new state, the state of Prussia after a northern crusade. But the point is, they were essentially Ronin. Soon, they came to be seen not as protectors of the faithful, but instead as a dangerous Careful. rogue yeah, force. Yeah, there's a big pit there. Famously, members the of the Knights Templar were present. burned at the stake <laughs> as heretics in France in the early 14th century as part of the Inquisition. The Crusaders eventually became a leaving crusading the army with no home, wandering the outskirts after their banishment. And for what it's worth, there's even a specifically draconic order, known as the Order of the Dragon. Technically more of an aristocratic order, but definitely based off of the rituals and style of the crusading orders, whose ceremonial sword shares the same patterns as oh. those of the banished knights. That's cool. As for the Volcano Manor itself, it is clearly modeled after medieval castles of the region. For example, Schwerin Castle, many of which That's were built cool during the Holy Crusading moly. time period, and then adapted Beautiful. from forts to palaces later on in medieval history. Oh. You don't have to be an architecture nerd to see the similarities, and yeah. a useful juxtaposition would be the Norman forts we've discussed previously, as having inspired the fortified manor in Stormvale. That's so cool. At least stylistically, the medieval castles of Central Europe and the Baltic states are the clear inspiration. It actually for looks the just like manor. it. Hey, Lambda. And finally, there are the yeah, myriad it looks just inspirations like it. That's from wicked. Baltic paganism, which we've already partially introduced in the story of Igle, Queen of Serpents. Yeah, I just want to say it was so awesome running around Elden Ring, and then like you, you find this like crevice or whatever you're like all right i'm gonna go through here and then you find this whole new zone and there's just this giant fucking castle and you're like where did you come from what are you and then you get this whole new basically like like country to explore elden ring is so fucking huge and then the map just kept expanding it was crazy Oh, that is so cool, TG. Oh my god. The only, like, castle that I've visited so far is Blarney Castle in uh, Ireland. It was really cool. I would love to see more castles. Yeah, you- oh, yeah, you've got a shit ton of castles over there. <laughs> oh, yeah, well- Elden Ring was very open world. Dark Souls 3 was not the same kind of open world at all. Must suck not being in walking distance of 20 different- Dude, living in Canada is so boring. All the buildings here are so god ugly. The only pretty buildings that we have here are like really fancy churches. And even then, there's not that many. We don't have any like ancient buildings here. Our our history here is within the last few hundred years, right? And even then they're like, oh gotta build it cheap, gotta build it cheap, gotta build it um like oh what's the word? What's the word I'm looking for? Well, just making effective use of space. Why am I I'm I'm blanking on the word. Either way, it's just efficient. Efficiency. Yeah, this is just pure efficiency. 
doesn't look nice. Well, insulated, yeah. I mean, you can. I mean, I'm more south than a lot of Europe, even though I'm Canadian. You know, I live. I live in like, I live in the dick of Canada. I'm in southern Ontario. Um, we still get really cold winters. Sometimes it gets to negative forty here, but you know. Yeah, but Japanese castles are so fucking cold in the winter. Yeah, they do exist. Yeah. There's actually a, a lot of Japanese castles. They're they're cool as hell. They look so cool. But yeah, no, like if I was stupid rich, I would build a beautiful castle and I would have it inspired off of Souls games. And I would when I died, I'd want it turned into a museum of like fantasy. Like, maybe put a couple realistic things in there, but I would want it to just be, like, a fantasy museum. Or maybe even while I'm still alive, you know? Just have a little wing that I live in or whatever, but... How cool would it... Would you go to a castle museum that was just a bunch of recreations of fantasy armor and weapons and tools and shit like that? Would you go... What if there was a library attached to it where you could get all sorts of really cool stuff? Oh, I would absolutely haunt the halls. 100%. I don't even believe in ghosts, but I'll make it happen. All right, everybody donate to the to the Fantasy Castle Fund. Pe I feel like people would travel to see that. I think that'd be cool as hell. I think that'd be so fucking wicked. Have actual fires to keep all the different rooms warm. That would be so wicked. Be so expensive. <laughs> oh my god. That would just be literally the coolest thing ever. Castle fit. Yes! Thank you, Lambda. Here we go. <laughs> it would be the most amazing thing ever. Oh my god. Alright, new life goal. I just gotta get really rich. <laughs> I'll do it. I promise. Everybody who donates X amount or more gets free access for the rest of their life. <laughs> that that would actually unironically be the coolest thing. I just need a home first because, you know, I, I need to make sure that I have a house to at least live the rest of my life out in in case it doesn't work out. <sighs> yeah, I think so too. I think so too. It'd be cool as hell. As an essentially animist polytheistic tradition, Baltic mythology tended to have special emphasis on natural phenomena, so there were innumerable gods and lesser deities I love like snakes. Menace, the moon, shepherd of the stars, oh, thank the you, Zaltis, the snake <laughs> thank symbol you of fertility, much, Thanks, which we guys. already featured in the tale of Igle, Hype and train. many more. Hype train Fire for apparently played a key role in many of the pagan rituals too. Even after being nominally Christianized following the crusading efforts, Pagan elements retained a crucial role. For example, Alagirdas, the Grand Duke of Lithuania, who, though he had previously been baptized, oh, continued to carry gargoyles. out the traditional pagan rituals. Ultimately, as we stated before, many of these pagan traditions became folklore, like the tale of Igle, Queen of the Serpents. Even today, there is a revivalist neo-pagan movement, which is called Remuva whose symbol Remover. is, you guessed it, a snake. One pagan tradition bears special mention, that of the solstice rituals, or sometimes called midsummer rituals. As is yeah, well known, know these either. festivals appear to be the basis for the dancing women in the windmill village. Adherents of Romuva, who we just mentioned, actually basically reenact this ritual still to this day. But oh, that's beyond cool. the stylistic similarity, this actually fits right in with our narrative of the residual pagan traditions of the Altus Plateau prior to its conversion to Erdtree monotheism. And though the specifics of the ritual are probably not the same, we doubt the Remuva are skinning virgin maidens in their festivals, the broad narrative is helpful to contextualize this seemingly out of place windmill village. It is part of the old pagan vestiges of the Altus Plateau just like the Serpent Cult of Mount Gelmir. 
it was likely actually part of the manor's fiefdom before the age of the Erd Tree, sure, with the sure. mills likely used to supply the grain to the manor itself. Hmm. After all, there is no arable land on a volcano. What we see today in the Windmill Village is simply a revivalist movement. The women, who are actually wearing Erd Tree clothes, indicating they were at some point converted to Erd Tree monotheism, are going back to their pagan roots. We'll return to their story in a moment. So to summarize, without taking these inspirations too literally, based on the architectural and religious elements present in the story, we can say that the ancient religion of Mount Gelmir is drawn from the broad inspiration of Central European and Baltic paganism. The architecture and the story of the Volcano Manor is based on the castles of this region, many of which were actually built by the various crusading orders, like the Livonian and Teutonic orders, <clears throat> cognates to the banished knights. The manor appears to have been incorporated into the Saint and Tree Empire by the banished knights, hence their banner is still flying in the manor. But at some point, just like in the Baltic pagan empire, the relatively tenuous balance between these Christianizing forces and the local pagan traditions was shattered. This shattering force was the arrival of a new faith and a new master. Of that chair. Anybody, anybody, uh, want a rock, paper, scissors for us to sit in that chair? Oh, that would be really cool, Sean. That would be cool. Of the manor, one who would not tolerate these ancient polytheistic traditions. Oh man, they tie you in too. Oh! <laughs> Enter Rikard. Rikard is clearly not native to Mount Gelmir. In no. fact, as a product of Radagon and Renala's union, yeah. he wasn't even born during the initial pagan days of Mount Gelmir. His title as Praetor, an old Roman military position, tells us much of his initial role here. Evidently, he was stationed in the manor, and according to Gideon, he is a ruthless justiciar who commands a company of inquisitors. So I mean, to be fair, I can totally see why Rikard would be against the tree, considering his dad abandoned his mother to go and be with Merica. It's like being resentful towards your dad that stepped out on you. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, no, the, the game is Elden Ring. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, could, I could understand being pretty resentful about that. I mean, Renala definitely did not recover. So he was lord of the manor in an <laughs> official capacity. He was there as part of an official inquisition. This means he was likely there to weed out the remnant of the ancient Gelmir religion at the behest of the Erd Tree. And Rikard, along with Inquisitor Giza, was absolutely brutal in executing this command. Woo. He even designed machines to abduct and terrorize the local population, based on the likeness of his own mother. And of course, even the name Inquisition is a reference to that period of bloody He's holding religious... a baby, did you see that? Did I? Okay. See, look, they're holding babies. I actually, I just noticed that. So they really are designed after Renala then, huh? Even the name Inquisition is a reference to that period of bloody religious persecution in European history. This campaign of terror explains why the serpent cult almost died out, and its secrets had to be rediscovered by Reichardt. At some point, Rikard pulled a Dances with Wolves, or perhaps for our younger audience, a Jake Sully from Avatar, and he turned sides, adopting the religion he was meant to exterminate, turning against the Erd Tree and its faithful, and leading to the current situation of the manor. Yeah, Rikard sickening. fed himself to the snake so that together they may grow and live eternally, and the birth of the man serpents from the repellent ritual soon followed. But that still only partially answers our initial question. That is, why is the snake so reviled by the Eritre Orthodoxy that its symbol would be ritualistically beaten in the Colosseum? 
and Rikard's blasphemy would necessitate the most appalling battle of the entire Shattering. Partly, this may be the age-old story of Christians suppressing pagans, Erdtree orthodoxy suppressing the pre-Erdtree local cults, especially those that offer alternative birthing rituals. But that explanation only goes so far. After all, the enmity goes both ways. Sure, the Erdtree faithful of Langdell want to destroy the Volcano Manor, but the Volcano Manor is just as zealous in its hatred of the Erdtree. Mm. Once again, there is an ancient story being alluded to here, and its key is in the painting of the burning Erdtree. Whether you interpret this painting as prophecy or as history, it is clear that the Volcano Manor wants to burn down the Erdtree. Actually, real-world prophets, like the biblical prophets, are always retrospectively talking about events that have already happened, and only ascribed post hoc as prophecy. That said, though a burning earth tree is conspicuously depicted throughout the manor, Reichard did not invent the notion of burning the earth tree. Otherwise, no, this notion would not be familiar to the spectators of the Colosseum, whose battles died out long ago by the time of the Age of Radagon. In other words, someone deep in the history of the Lands Between must have tried to burn the Erd Tree before. But it was burned, right? And that's why it's a spectral tree? And why Landell is covered in ash? Remember those dancing women in the Windmill Village? As we've said before, they are based off of pagan summer solstice festivals. But specifically in game, they are Yo, apparently ritualistically up. skinning those whom they deem pure enough, likely virgin maidens based on the blue version of their armor set. So let's address the supple-skinned elephant in the room. There's a godskin apostle at the top of the windmill village, yeah, and why? he's not just passing through. Some of the women appear to be praying to him, and of course, there's the obvious connection between the dancing women's skinning ritual and the notion of skinning the gods. So what gives? This all seems to imply a connection between the ancient pagan traditions of the Altus Plateau, like the Serpent Cult and the Midsummer Festival, and the Black Flame Apostasy. Let's pull on that thread a little bit and see what we can reveal. For one, besides the Godskin Apostle in the Windmill Village, there's a Godskin Noble in the Temple of Igle, with a Black Flame Monk standing guard outside. It's not as if there's anyone else inside the temple, so it would suggest that the Noble is there by invitation, although we can't say for sure. Certainly there's no evidence of fighting between the Man Serpents and the Black Flame Monk here, no, the snakes are so, so cute. perhaps what the, the hell? Serpent and the Black Flame are I love allied. Them. Speaking of man serpents, their well, patented they're more like lizards, Stretch Armstrong but... move is suspiciously similar to that of the Godskin Apostles, again yeah. indicating some relationship. And most suggestively of all, the Godslayer's greatsword, the sacred relic of their queen, as well as the Godslayer's seal, are specifically inlaid with obsidian, a volcanic <clears throat> glass yeah. specifically formed when lava rapidly cools. Yep. No better place to source obsidian than from a perpetually active volcano like True. Mount Gelmir. True that. What this all seems to indicate is that, at some point, there was an alliance of sorts, or at least a relationship, between the Godskins and Mount Gelmir. But here's where things get really interesting. Oh. Because the Black Flame monks are specifically referred to as traitors. They started out as fire monks, then swore fealty to the Black Flame instead, marking them out as traitors to the Erd Tree. Their armor, which still has the Fell like God the, the on their giant. chest piece, betrays this origin story. And if you remember, that is exactly how the snake is referred to in the Duelist Helm's description, a traitor to the Erd Tree. There are many heresies and competing factions in Elden Ring, but these two the Snake and the Black Flame Monks are specifically called traitors. They were once aligned to the Erd Tree, and then they betrayed the cause. And like we said, they must have done something that everybody knows about, because the crowds at the Colosseum sure love seeing them beaten and battered. So, what did they do? Some long necks. Well, 
how about a conspiracy to kill the gods and burn down the Erd Tree? We know there is a relationship between the giant's flame and the serpent god, because those same duelist armor sets we've been mentioning actually have the one-eyed god on them. Yeah. This, together with the serpent carving on the okay. giant's forge, is evident of an ancient relationship between the serpent and the giant's flame. Perhaps that is why, in addition to a godskin apostle, we find the fire's deadly sin incantation, which speaks of a prophet who envisioned the burning of the Erd Tree in the windmill village. And at some point, an ultimate treachery was committed. The flame monks, duty-bound to protect the giant's flame, switched allegiances and began serving the black flame instead. Perhaps, like the biblical serpent in the Garden of Eden, who committed a treachery against God not through direct action, but by convincing Eve to partake in the forbidden fruit, the serpent god convinced some of the flame monks to turn sides, a metaphorical snake in the garden, seducing them with tales of power they could acquire. And what is the black flame but a combination of flame and the power of destined death? Exactly the combination we need to burn down the Erd Tree in-game. There is even cut content suggesting that, at least at one stage of development, the Black Flame was meant to burn down the Erd Tree. Oh. Credit to the YouTube channel V-Limit for pointing this out. Mm, oh, that's cool. Death is unbound. Black Flames have devoured the Erd Tree, and the lands between are shrouded by death. Dark. So that might have been like a third, maybe a third way to burn Cut down content, the tree? Though that is, with the usual caveats, its implications still linger in the broader story. What we as Tarnished do to burn down the Erd Tree is to start the fire with the Flame of Ruin and then allow it to fully take effect by freeing the Rune of Death. Oh god, you're in for a so trip, again, Lambda. It's such a good those game. Two powers could be combined? What if there was a flame that already had the power of the Rune of Death within it? Our point here is that the Black Flame is a flame uniquely capable of burning the Erd Tree. It is no coincidence that it just happens to have the two elements required by the player character to burn down the Erd Tree. Flame and Destined Death. Oh, God. Of course, some of this story would require some creative speculation to fill in the gaps, because we just don't know the details of the plot. But we do know, beyond a doubt, that there was a connection between the power of flame and the serpent god, back in the pagan days of the Lands Between. The serpent is connected to both the giant's flame and to the black flame. This connection, and the treachery of the black flame apostasy, is likely the answer to our initial question, why the snake is so despised by the Erdtree faithful. Snake and its followers are vestiges of the Lands Between's pagan past, when life had a beginning and an end. Forests burned, and nothing, not even the sacred Erd Tree, was beyond the purging power of flame. Of course, this ancient enmity between the serpent and the Erd Tree is not so easily forgotten. True, the giant's flame was confined atop the mount, and the godskins were defeated, the source of their power sealed away. But one day, a new master of the manor was assigned, and in time, he too would be seduced by the proverbial snake in the garden, and the conspiracy to burn the Erd Tree would be plotted once again. The ancient enmity rekindled. Rude. When we return to the story, we'll explore the first burning of the Erd Tree, and its transformation into merely an object of yeah. faith. Cool. All right. Well, there we go. I learned a little bit there, huh? Did you guys learn? Did you guys learn anything cool and new and interesting? I did use the spear. Yeah. It was. I tried, but I did. I've got a bang on my lap, and she's so cozy. Ah. Is it just me or is caffeine starting to make me tired? Has anybody else experienced that? Do you have a will you have a coffee and then you get tired? <laughs> Do 
Yeah, no, I, um, I liked that too, Bridges. I thought that was pretty cool. You know, history repeats itself and whatnot. Caffeine junkie? Oh, totally. Totes. All of my goats. No, that was cool. That was nice. That that was really, really good. Um, I like his channel. That's really cool. I like how he does equate it to real life. Real life lore. Isn't that- I think there's a channel called, like, real life lore or something like that. I think I've seen a few videos by them. I love history, but holy moly, there's so much that, uh has happened all over the world, all the time. It's hard to remember everything. I don't know, Sean. I feel like, I feel like it will, or it has. We don't know all the history of the world. We only know a little bit. No, Real Life Lore, I, I believe that's the name of the channel, and it, it is an actual history YouTube channel with real history. And I think that they're also going over modern events as well, almost like an archive. There are a lot of really interesting YouTube channels out there uh, that go over history and modern conflict and whatnot. I find those channels very interesting. I like... I can't always retain everything, um, but they're still definitely very, very interesting and fun to listen to.